Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. And in this video, we're gonna do a complete statistical analysis breakdown of a match played between Kevin Garlington of EssentialTennis.com and Ian Westerman of EssentialTennis.com. Originally, this footage was put up on their YouTube channel. It's still there. You can still check out the original footage there. But we wanted to take it a step further and do a complete stats breakdown and a 3D analysis breakdown of the match. So I want to thank EssentialTennis.com for providing this footage. If you want to see our thoughts on why the match was won or lost, stay tuned because it's coming up next. So for this particular breakdown, we're going to be using Dartfish 10 Pro S software. We've been using Dartfish 10 software for the last five years to break down tennis matches at a professional level, an amateur level, every level in between. So by using Dartfish 10 software, what we can do is actually go through the stats on the left side of the screen. And if I just wanted to particularly watch all of Ian's T-serve placements, you can see when I click on T, it brings up all 25 of the T-serves he hit. If I hit wide, it would bring up all 24 of the wide serves that he hit. But let's just go T here first. And just to give an example, if I click on any of these points or any of these, we'll get the ability to immediately watch all of the T-serve points that were played. If I want to skip to the next one, I can skip to the next point and watch that T-serve placement and point. I have the ability to go to the next point and look at the next T-serve placement there. And we can just kind of toggle through and watch these points. We can watch the full point if we want. We can watch just a partial bit of the point to see kind of what happened or what the result was. But being able to use software like this or stats breakdown software is really important, not just for the statistical part, but to actually be able to go back and watch what happened, examine it, and then improve our play. There's a pretty heavy focus these days on you know the length of rallies and who's winning what points during lengths of rallies. So the first stat that we want to look at is the shot length category. And all that really means is what are the rally lengths in a point? That does include the serve. So we have one to four shots, we have five to eight shots nine to 12 shots, and then we have long rallies that are 13 plus shots. Those would be considered to be really long rallies. In this particular match, 60% of the points played were one to four shots. That means we had a serve return, a serve plus one, which is the first shot after the return, and then a return plus one, which is simply the returner's second shot. 26% of the points played in this match were five to eight shots. That means they were a little bit more like a medium rally length. We had a serve, a return, a little bit more of a drawn out point, but maybe not a super long rallying type of point. And then we also had in this match just 10% of points were 9 to 12 shots. So definitely longer points, a little more grinding, a little bit of defense going on, but just 10% of the points played in this match were 9 to 12 shots. And even though Ian did a really good job in the super long rally length category of 13 plus shots, only 3% of the points played were actually 13 plus shots. Now, if we break down those stats a little bit further, Kevin actually won 55% of the one to four shot points. So usually whoever wins the one to fours, the quick stuff, a lot of times they come out on top. The longer the points got in this particular match, the more trouble Kevin had winning those points. So it's really important to remember that you wanna win the one to fours because that's the majority of the points, but that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna win the match. You have to be able to do more than just win the short points. And as the rallies got longer, Ian won a lot more points. So when they played five to eight shot rallies, Ian won 55% of those points. If it was nine to 12 shots, Ian won 58% of those points. When it came to 13 plus shots, they only played four of those points total, and those were split even at 50-50. But you can see that anything over one to four, Ian was either in charge of those points or winning those points, or he split worst case scenario. One thing I like to do is I like to break down every shot by the position on the court that the players were in. So just as an example, we divide the court up into five different sections or zones is what I like to call them, which consist of zone five, zone four, zone three, zone two, or zone one. And where the zones are helpful from is understanding what types of shots you should be hitting from which positions in the court. So where those zones come into play is we keep track of two things from there. We keep track of where the player is hitting the shot from, so what zone, and we also keep track of how deep their ball is landing on the other side of the court, because we know that depth is valuable in forcing errors and you know doing damage to our opponent is really important. Keeping that in mind when we're talking in terms of shot depth, one of the issues that Kevin had in this match is that only 19% of his shots were landing in zone three, which is that three quarter court to the baseline area. So even if Kevin's hitting aggressively and hitting hard, it's gonna be difficult for Kevin to hurt Ian because of the fact that his shots just aren't landing deep, right? So while the shots had really good pace, he didn't have enough neck clearance, 
and he lacked depth on his shot, so it was very difficult for him, especially in the first set, to hurt Ian just by hitting hard, but not hitting deep. Also, when we're lacking depth on our shots, not only are we not able to hit our opponent, but we're giving them a better chance to get closer inside the court and hurt us. They're closer to us. The closer your opponent is to you, the more aggressive they should be able to hit in most situations because they're closer to the targets on the other side of the court and they can do more with the ball. If I've got somebody pinned really far back deep, it's going to be difficult for them to do anything with the ball. If they're tighter to the baseline or inside the baseline, they can hurt me a lot sooner and a lot more easily. So we talked about Kevin only hitting about 19% of his shots in zone three in that deepest zone of the court. Ian hit 39% of his shots in that third zone from three-quarter court back to the baseline. And that let him not only get aggressive and dictate the points, but it also let him play good defense in certain situations by keeping his depth, right, and keeping Kevin a little bit further back uh, even on defensive situations. So now that we've done a little bit of stats breakdown, let's get into the really interesting stuff, which is that 3D analysis breakdown. So Dartfish 10 has some really cool tools for doing 3D analysis. This video is not sponsored by Dartfish. I've purchased every version of Dartfish since Dartfish 7, so 7, 8, 9, and 10. The 3D analysis section and tools are the newest component to version 10 of the software. So a couple things to point out just when using these 3D analysis tools. Number one, they're really powerful. Number two, they can really break down film well and show students or players what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. So the first thing I wanna highlight though is big and small target areas. So anything here in the red is gonna be considered a small target. If a player hits a ball that lands in there on the fly, that's a small target area. That means anything inside the blue area is gonna be a big target. Another thing to remember about the big and small target area is that anything that's landing in a small target area is two or less feet from the single sideline. So this red shaded area is two feet from the single sideline, and this red shaded area over here is two or less feet from the single sideline. So again, anything two or less feet from the single sideline is a small target, anything inside there is a big target. So let's see what happens as the point unfolds. Ian hits a nice aggressive return here and it lands in a green area, right? Or it's a green target, which is a big target. So it's a safe play. Another thing you're gonna notice here that's really cool about Dartfish analysis software, 3D analysis tools allow us actually to track the amount that the players have moved during the point and the speed that they're currently moving. And we've got initials above them and this will track with them throughout the point. Let's see what Kevin elects to do with this ball. The first thing that we notice is as Kevin backs up diagonally here, we can see the footwork trail that he's leaving. He's got an open racket face, so he's hitting a slice. Unless this slice is either really far to this corner or this corner, right, a small target, or it's really deep, Ian's probably going to get a good opportunity to get aggressive on the next shot. Let's see what happens. He gets it fairly deep. The issue with this, as we can see, is Ian's got a nice semi-open stance set up. He's really well balanced. And just judging by how closed off his hips are at the moment, my guess is Ian's probably going to take this ball down the line. He's probably not going to go cross but he's really well balanced. Kevin hasn't done enough with this slice to put Ian in a defensive position, right? He probably should have come over that ball right there. And we can definitely tell Ian's going down the line. You can see his non-hitting arm here has not cleared. And the way that the hips are pointing, you can tell that he's gonna go down the line here. He's not gonna take this cross, okay? Kevin kind of recognizes this. He's still shading this area of the court with his footwork. So he's anticipating the shot to be somewhere around here. Let's see what happens. Ian hits a small target here. It's right in that small target fringe area. So it's a small target, two or less feet from the single sideline. Kevin's going over to move to this ball. And what happens is Kevin's initially moving forward into the court, but he realizes quickly that Ian's ball is close to the sideline. He's not going to be able to move forward and get to that effectively. So then he starts to back up a little bit as he moves. So we see him do that a little bit there. And he slices again. Let's see what happens with this slice. He gets pretty good depth on that slice. But again, he's a little bit more towards the middle of the court, and Ian looks really well balanced. Let's see what happens with the contact here. With as open as Ian's hips are in this particular situation, it looks like he's going to take this ball across somewhere around here and get aggressive again, trying to isolate Kevin's backhand, right? So he's got plenty of time to do this. He's well balanced, and that slice wasn't effective at backing Ian up. So again, we see another big target from Ian in this particular shot. Kevin's got an open racket face here. So Ian should be anticipating some type of a slice or a possible drop shot. Kevin slices down the line and Kevin gets really nice depth on this particular shot. But again, if we look at Ian's balance and how he's set up, he's not threatened by this whatsoever. And he has plenty of time as well to step around and hit a forehand because Kevin hit a slice 
that didn't have a lot of pace on it. So that gave Ian a lot of time, and we saw Ian move around the ball here. Give him a lot of time to do that. If we just get a little zoomed in look here real quick, we can see that Ian's really well balanced, and he's ready to tee off on this ball from that open stance position or semi-open stance. And just judging by his racket position and how he's lined up, it looks like the position here of the hips indicates that he's gonna go a little bit more of cross court here and try to hurt Kevin to the open court. Let's see what happens. Again, Ian hits another small target. This ball lands right on that small target line area right here. And now we see Kevin scrambling over to the shot. Kevin's mistake a little bit here on the defense was that he moved forward but he should have been moving maybe a little bit more back just because Ian's so well balanced. Ian's not backed up. He's not, you know, back by the curtain area. He's ready to load up and hit an aggressive shot. Kevin makes the mistake of moving diagonally forward here to cut this off. He should have given himself a little more time to go this way. But again, you can see the trail of the footwork is actually diagonal forward here. Didn't give himself enough time to get to the ball. And let's see what happens he's forced into an error. So that's just a really good example. We see a couple of things there. Number one, we can see that all of Kevin's targets were big targets, right? All pretty conservative. But what this didn't do, especially all the slicing, is it didn't move Ian in any way where he was threatened, you know, in terms of his position. Ian took some more risk. He went with a small target off the first or second shot with another small target to finish the point off and really got Kevin running but a large part of this was due to the fact that Kevin didn't get a lot of depth on his strokes, right? And he wasn't spreading the ball around at all and forcing Ian into some different positions. The depth would have helped probably a little bit more to keep Ian at bay. So now let's move on to the next 3D analysis point. So again, here you can see we've got the small target area set up. I like to use that just to see where the players are actually hitting their shots during a point. And let's check out this point again, different point. Kevin serves wide this time and he serves to Ian's backhand. Now, one thing that's a little bit unusual is Ian was getting away with, and he did this quite a bit, the majority of his returns were actually taking place inside the baseline in this particular match. Ian actually hit about 93% of his first serve returns off Kevin's first serve from inside the baseline, which is really difficult to do. And I know a lot of his goal, especially as the second set went along, was to get inside the court right, chip and charge a little bit, he changed tactics, but it's extremely difficult to do this. So if the server either does one of two things, either serves really aggressively to the corner, so if Kevin hits really big serves here, or really nasty slice serves here, it's gonna be very difficult for the returner to be inside the baseline like this, to take away your time, and for them to return from inside the baseline. So it's pretty amazing that he was able to hit 94% of his first serve returns from inside the baseline. Very uncommon to be able to do something like that at a really high level, so credit to him. Uh, let's see this point kind of unfold. You can see Ian's chip return here, is a little bit short though. It's a big target this time and it is short. Kevin's making a diagonal move forward inside the court and he has the opportunity to get really aggressive with this ball because he's moving inside the court and taking this from zone three. He does that, but his target is maybe a little bit conservative here. When you have a ball like this and you've got an opponent who's shading this side of the court, you've got a really good opportunity to maybe even take a small target from this position because we're moving inside and we're well balanced maybe get really aggressive with this ball to end the point early or get him on the run, but the target ends up being a little bit conservative here. And then Ian covers that pretty easily. Although I'll say this, with that depth on that ball, you can see Ian's a little bit uncomfortable in the back of the court there in terms of his balance, right? He's a little bit locked up from this position because of the depth of Kevin's shot. So that's important to remember as well. Ian hits a big target again. This time that target lands though inside zone one, so this ball is pretty short. Again, we could see the balance that was going on there and the uncomfortableness of Kevin's depth on that particular shot, so we can see the ball landing here. Kevin let this one come to him a little bit. It would be nice to see him off of that short, weak ball, step up a little bit more inside the court and not let that particular ball drop as much as it did. It kind of dropped from here, possible contact point. It dropped a little bit more to that waist height which is giving Ian time to recover on the other side of the court and prepare for the next ball. Kevin gets some good depth here. Again, he goes big target, uh, a little bit towards the middle of the court here. Ian chips again, and this chip lands in zone two. So this one's a little deeper though. We saw the first ball land here, second ball here. This one, better depth, neutralizes Kevin a little bit. Kevin rolls this short in the uh, the front part of zone two again a big target 
Ian Chips. And what cost Kevin here was that ball landed a little bit short and Ian was able to actually step forward on this slice, right? So he's moving in and he's getting inside the court on this particular slice. We can see he's comfortably stepping forward into that ball, right? He moves in and we can see that he's comfortable on that slice and he's driving that slice cross court. And you can see it gets better depth on it because he was able to step into it, right? So this time the slice lands in zone three, the front area of zone three. And now Kevin, you can see the footwork, right? He's starting to back up as he moves diagonally to his right here. So you can see he backs off the ball because he's realizing that it's pretty deep. And he's a little off balance here. Did a good job of coming out of that semi-open stance and extending his right leg. But he is a little off balance and he's backing up. So what he should do in this particular scenario, in this case, is probably just play a big target cross here. He's played his other ones, you know, conservatively here. Play another one, big cross, and then kind of get into a better position for the next shot. Let's see what happens. Kind of plays the small target area really deep. And he misses that shot long. And he loses the point. You can see the frustration there. He's kind of laughing there. He's a little, little upset with himself. But I didn't necessarily like the shot choice, right? He played big targets the entire point. Not that he needed to. There was some opportunity actually to take more risk. He didn't take it at the right time. He waited until he got into the deepest part of the court here off Ian's best shot. And then he decided he was going to go for a small target. So he just made the wrong choice. Should have maybe played a, a more conservative choice. Deep green, right? Deep big target. Try to hurt Ian. And then see if you can get one of these better, shorter balls to work with on the next shot. And then, you know, he's frustrated at that error. But it all came down to his choices in the point. So now we're going to go into the third point a little bit. But I just want to talk stats again just for a second. Because something really interesting happened in this match with Ian's shot selection. And that's that Ian went down the line with his shots 45% of the time. He actually went down the line more with any of his shots than anything else. Cross court or the middle third of the court. What I like to do is break down the court into three sections evenly. So we have the right third of the court here, then we have the middle third, and then we have that left third. Ian hit 45% of his balls down the line. 28% of Ian's shots landed in the middle third of the court. 27% of his shots went cross court. So that's pretty low percentage to play like that. He was able to get away with that and do a good job with that. It means he has a lot of control over the ball, right? We see different numbers when we look at pro stats and we've done a lot of research, a course available on that research. So you can see data on those numbers in that actual course. But keep that in mind as you're watching these points. Look for the number of down the lines that he's hitting because he's hitting down the line almost 50% of the time. And one of the things that allowed Ian to play a little bit more risky, we talked about Kevin only hitting 19% of his shots in the deepest part of the court, right? But also Kevin hit 47% of his shots to the middle third of the court. And what that allows Ian to do then is go for small targets to either corner, left or right, if he wants to. It really puts Kevin in a position where he has to run, and you don't want to be in that position. So we typically want to avoid hitting to the middle, unless we're hitting really aggressively deep or high and deep. 47% of Kevin's shots landing in that middle third of the court hurt him tremendously, especially in that first set. Kevin's other shot selections were 28% cross court and he only went down the line 25% of the time. So let's look at the third 3D analysis point now and keep in mind some of the things with depth, targets, down the line, shot selection. Keep all that in mind as you're watching this. So let's let this play through a little bit. Really good serve by Ian. Love that T serve, especially to the backhand. Great serve. Kevin's issue or mistake with his movement here is he's a little bit moving diagonally back to his left, right? So he probably did that because of the quality of this serve right here. Ian hit a really nice serve to the T, close to the line, relatively close to the line. And Kevin's move though is diagonally back to the left, which means it's gonna take longer for Kevin's slice to get over to this side of the court. It also means Kevin's already backed up in this point, and he's basically inviting Ian inside the baseline potentially to hit the next shot. Because it's gonna be difficult for Kevin's body weight to be moving backwards like this, uh, even slightly, for him to be slicing and then pushing Ian back in some way. More than likely, Ian's going to be moving inside the court on his next shot. Let's see what happens. The slice does land short. Ian doesn't move in, but Kevin did hit this in the very fringe front area of zone two, and Ian moves sideways to this particular ball, and he looks ready to attack this forehand, right? Now, because Ian is a little bit inside the court, or he's close to that baseline area, you can see he's going to go down the line with this. We can tell by the position of his hips. Kevin is shading cross because that's the most likely shot, but Ian elects to go down the line because he's comfortable, right, in his court position over on that side of the court. 
Kevin was unable to push him back, but it all started with the way he moved to that first return. So we can see Ian hits another target here. This is down the line. It's a big target, kind of close to the small target area, but a big target, right, in zone two. So the depth isn't there, but he doesn't really need the depth because he's got good position on this side of the court. More depth would help, but he's got Kevin in a scramble situation here. Kevin runs diagonally back to his right to retrieve that shot, tries to keep the contact in front of his body, right? Let's see what Kevin does with the ball. He loops it to try to get depth, which is super smart. Tennis 101, right? We want to get some height on our shot to try to push our opponent back if we're in a defensive position, if possible. So Kevin does that. He gets decent depth considering the situation he was in. It's still in zone two. It's not in the deepest zone of the court. So it didn't back Ian up. It looks like from the position of Ian's hips and his body and that he hasn't fully rotated, that this ball is going down the line somewhere around here. Let's see what happens. Again, he does. It's a big target again, but it is pretty close to the small target area. But again, we see a big target. Kevin has to come out of the right corner to the left. We see Kevin likes to give himself time in these defensive situations by backing up a little bit diagonally with his movement, right? You can see the orange trail making that move. He keeps contact in front of his body. Let's see what he does with the shot. He goes cross. It's a pretty good ball in terms of the left to right, right? But it's not as deep as we'd like. It's pretty deep, but it could be a little bit deeper. Ian is in a little bit of a scramble. He goes to the slice forehand here, and Ian's moving a little bit diagonally back to his left, which means he's a little uncomfortable with this shot, right? So Kevin, at least in this scenario, can hopefully hope for a shorter ball. Let's see what happens. So Ian might play some good defense here. And what Ian did that was really smart is Ian gave this ball height over the net to get himself depth, right, from a, a tough position. So you can see that net clearance there, how high Ian's ball is over the net as it's crossing. That's probably eight feet above um, or off the ground, you know, five to six feet, seven feet above the net. So he's going to get some nice depth here. Now, he gets that nice depth, but one thing we know about slicing versus hitting topspin is a slice isn't going to back an opponent up as much back here as topspin shots, right? Kevin could save himself some ground, not back up as far by not backing up this much and taking it a little earlier than he is. You can see where this ball is going, and Kevin's off screen, but I'd like to see Kevin hitting that ball probably on the rise right here. And he's not making that contact point. He's letting it come into him even more. We can see he's still backing up by the circle tracker here before contacting and then hitting that back. From that position, I'll say this, though. Kevin did a very good job of getting really good depth on the ball, but he gives Ian way too much time to get set up potentially for the next shot by backing up so far off that slice. So really good depth there. Zone three for sure. Ian looks a little uncomfortable on this particular ball, but we can tell... Again, that he's going down the line on this particular shot. The position of the hips kind of give the down the line away here. What Ian does is get really good neck clearance over that net again, probably four to six feet on this particular shot, right? Kevin's on the run again because of the depth. You can see it lands in zone three, almost a small target again. Kevin backs up on that diagonal to give himself some more time. But we can see again, Kevin's playing pretty far back in these points. Kevin does a good job here. Big target, pretty deep, zone three area. Ian is uncomfortable in this particular slice. We can actually see the position of Ian and his balance here on this particular stroke. He's off balance by the way he's leaning on this shot. We can see that. And the way his back is positioned, he's off balance and he's uncomfortable on this shot. So it's a good sign for Kevin and now what we'll see is if Kevin moves forward inside the court, right? So Kevin hit this shot. He is moving inside the court or seeing the uncomfortableness of Ian's body position, right? So he's using some anticipation, some body cues. And he moves in a little bit. And he does get the short ball, right? He hit a very good shot from a tough position. And he does hit the short ball. Um, the issue with this, again, is the time he's giving Ian. So we can see the peak of the ball for Kevin, the contact height, would be somewhere up here, right? He could have made contact about four and a half feet off the ground, but he ends up making contact at about this height right here. So about a foot and a half, he lets that ball drop before he contacts it. I don't know if he's more comfortable with hitting balls at waist height or if it's just something he did in this particular point. But when you've got Ian in trouble on this shot, what you need to do 
is you need to make sure that you're taking his time to recover away, right? And that you're punishing him for hitting this weak ball. Also, if you take that a little earlier, you can get inside the court more in here instead of taking it back just uh, inside the baseline here. So it's all about taking the time in these types of situations. See, Kevin does hit a good aggressive shot here, right? Big target, it lands in zone two a little bit short. Ian's scrambling at this point, and you can see he's pretty off balance, having a tough time trying to get in position for this ball. And then he hits short down the line on accident. I don't believe he intended to do that. It was just sort of a scramble situation. Kevin's moving diagonally forward inside the court. He could take this ball up here at chest height, which can be difficult for a one-hander, but what you're gonna see it happens is he gives Ian more time to recover back here, and he lets this ball drop again. So we've had two consecutive balls where he let the ball drop too much, and he's giving Ian too much time to recover and get ready for the next ball. You can see what Ian does here as Kevin lets that ball fall more to waist height. Ian starts cheating to the right, which is very smart. He starts anticipating open court, and then he goes and hits that running forehand again. So Kevin went from a position where he had two consecutive balls where he's hurting Ian, this one right here, and then he had another chance to really hurt Ian right here, but he let it drop too much, and that's a mistake we don't want to make if we don't have to. And then Ian goes from a defensive position to suddenly Kevin being inside the court to being outside the court and having to scramble and run diagonally back here to a right. Ian hits a conservative target, big target, it lands in the second zone, but look where Kevin backs up to as he goes to scramble and hit this. He has to back up quite a bit, so he retreats a ton from this position back to this position. He's in a tough balance situation here, but Kevin does a remarkable job of hitting a pretty aggressive ball from a really tough spot, and he gets this ball deep, big target again, really deep this time, and you can see Ian off this shot, right, he thought he had Kevin in a pretty bad spot, and he really did. But had Ian hit that ball deeper back here, it would have been extremely difficult for Kevin to get the depth that he ends up getting on this shot right here. Ian was actually moving forward, anticipating a short ball as he should have been, right? But Kevin gets such good length from a tough spot that he ends up having to back up. And you can see on how uncomfortable his positioning is back at the baseline. So Ian's backing up from this ball because he's really uncomfortable with it, right? And we can see the body position backing away. This should guarantee from that position, that spot, some type of short ball for Kevin. We'll see what actually happens though. It is short, it's fading a little bit. And a good way to tell where that ball is going is just to watch Ian's racket face, right? So we can see the racket face here and the body is pointing a little bit in this direction. And the racket face is pointing this way that the ball is gonna land relatively short over here. Kevin does the right thing moving diagonally forward inside the court here. Maybe not the best choice to move around and hit a forehand because if Ian's able to do something with the next shot, Kevin's taking himself off the court a little bit, right? And that's what happened to him last time. Uh, he had a backhand from over here, but he ended up in a really tough spot in this position. So hits the forehand, hits a conservative target here, big target, but it's basically in the middle of the court. This leaves us wide open for Ian at this point to go open court, uh, especially if he came over this ball. He does go with the slice, but he still probably could go here. He's got the time, and Kevin's pretty far off the court at this point, but let's see what happens. Ian hits a nice little kind of chip drop shot here at Kevin's feet, right? Kevin's got a really narrow base on this particular shot. I'd like to see that base wider for better balance, and you're able to get lower if you have a wider base, right? But you can see the base is pretty narrow, so Ian just hits short at his feet. He's got this narrow base, and he pops it right into the net. So there's just some strategical things there that are happening within the point. You know, technique's extremely important, but these points and analyzing things in this way shows you how important tactical situations and decisions are that you're making in your tennis matches and in your points. It's really important that you're taking time when you need to take time and you're maybe giving up you know, some court position when you need to give up court position. But there's definitely some examples here in this point of our players maybe not doing the right thing with the ball at the right time and that hurting them. Kevin definitely with some of the choices to let the ball drop when he could take it on the rise or take it at peak, right? Another interesting thing if you're looking just at this point with the targets here, and I'm just gonna kind of go back to the beginning of the point for a second and let it play. But if you're looking at the targets, Ian had 72% of his total targets in this match that landed in the big target area, right? That were green balls. Kevin had 81%. So Kevin's targets were definitely a little more conservative. 
Ian's targets were more risky for sure. Although I'll say this, I think he may have felt the need in certain scenarios and situations to go for smaller targets and might have felt the need to take bigger risk, right? So that all plays a factor in it too. But he did play with some very risky targets during this match. Just remember as well, if you want to see actual real data on what pro target percentages are for the best players in the world, Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, Serena, uh, Sharapova, Halep, you can see those numbers at tennisunleashed.net. We've got a single shot selection and core position course that focuses on those targets. So that's really important to remember. You can actually see what the percentages are for the best players in the world. And also in the comments below, what do you think? Do you think that pro target percentages are higher for their big targets or lower than what we've seen at 72% for Ian and 81% for Kevin? And that was our ground stroke breakdown for the match played between Ian and Kevin along with the stats breakdown. We're actually gonna do a part two on this and we're gonna break down the serve and volley points that were played between Ian and Kevin and show you some different stats on those, some different 3D analysis to show you how to potentially break down a really good serve and volley. Ian's a really good serve and volley, especially with that hook serve and that, that T placement serve. We're gonna show you that in the next video, part two of this, more stats, more 3D analysis, and a way to break down the serve and volleyer. Just remember, if you like this content and you wanna see more videos like this, smash that like and subscribe button below. I'm Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net, and we'll see you in part two.